And welcome back to Meeting of the Minds. Today we're going to be understanding the modern concept of Judaism. And who better to teach us but the great Roy Shulman, author of Salvation is from the Jews. Thank you very much, Roy, for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure. So we just you just recently told me, or a few moments ago, that you have a big series on this. I uh, like... All of us in this kind of freelance ministry business, uh, the uh, COVID-19 business has kind of shut down most of our public appearances or preaching even. So a lot of us have turned to the Internet. I think you're among those. And uh, I've started doing a lot of live streams on my YouTube channel. And I just finished uh, 12 two hour live streams on what is Judaism is the name of the series. So it's exactly down the lines of, of today's show. Excellent. So we are, we are ready to roll. So if you could please explain to us, what is the Torah, what is the Talmud, and what is the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah, broadly speaking? And uh, you're leaving out the rest of the Old Testament for some reason? And the, and the Old Testament, sure, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Correct. Uh, it's sacred scripture as Catholics, we know that, right? It's the uh, inspired word of God. So, Okay. Um, I'm trying to trying to be concise here. Okay, the 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 Jewish people as a religion, let's say, uh, really began with the Exodus from Egypt. Before the Exodus from Egypt, they were a clan, basically. They were a clan with a special relationship with God and so forth. Um, when Moses took them out of uh, Egypt. They, you know, came to uh, Mount Sinai and Moses went up Mount Sinai and he spent 40 days up there alone with God and he came down with the Torah. So basically, the Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament in a Catholic Bible, uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And um, according to Jewish theological belief, it was essentially dictated to Moses by God on top of Mount Sinai. And uh, it is the, you know, just like, just like in uh, the Mass, you have the first reading, which used to be an epistle reading. Now it's Old Testament or epistle reading. And then you have the gospel reading. And you all stand for the gospel. We all stand for the gospel because it's more elevated than the rest. It's kind of like more direct somehow connection to God. Um, the Torah, the Torah in Judaism is like the gospel. In other words, it's the highest of the high. And the rest of the Old Testament, which is about whatever it is, about 67 books or something, um, which are the prophets and the wisdom literature. And um, that's it, actually. The prophets and the wisdom literature are, they're also sacred scripture in Judaism but they are not quite as directly coming from God, and they're more like the epistles in the Old Testament. So, in fact, you have the same thing happening in the synagogue pretty much. The, the way the Torah is treated is, di is different from the way the rest of the Old Testament is treated. But all of the Old Testament, including the Torah, is sacred scripture. And um, if uh, any of your viewers want to sound like they know something about Judaism, the word in Judaism for the Old Testament is Tanakh, Tanakh. That's actually a little bit interesting as Catholics because Tanakh is an acronym. It's got a T, it's got an N, it's got a H. And the T is for Torah. The N is for Nevi'im, which means prophets. And the H is for um, Ketuvah, the uh, wisdom writings. And so, um, because the Old Testament, you know, in addition to the first five books, you have the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and so forth. And then you have Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and so forth. And that's wisdom literature. Now, the reason that's a little bit interesting, maybe, is when you read the Gospels, Jesus says, um, you have the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets. So... We don't know whether he's saying we, you have the law and the prophets. He's probably saying you have the Old Testament, you have the sacred scriptures, because 
that's the terminology for the sacred scriptures in Judaism. A lot, much longer answer. It's got to be a 10 hour show. <laughs> Go ahead. No, that's that's great. Oh, and the then, Talmud, the Talmud. Yeah, Talmud oh, my, Talmud. my, my. That's that's six hours in my series all by itself. Excellent. OK, it's really quite a story. So here's the story. The story is it's actually got a parallel in the Catholic Church. In the Catholic Church, we have the sacred scripture and we also have the magisterium and the reason we have the magisterium which defines dogma right so there's a lot of dogma catholic dogma that is not directly found in sacred scripture and yet dogma is considered revealed in, i mean in other words is the um if something's pronounced dogma in the catholic church you you have to give it the assent of faith Right. You shouldn't don't nod so tentatively. I mean, come on, <laughs> um, yes. because yes, exactly, because it is to be considered as revealed by God through the teaching authority of the church. Why do we need dogma in additional sacred scripture? Well, you see why every time you pass by yet another Protestant denomination, it's clear that sacred scripture, because it's relatively uh, con compressed, doesn't go into enough detail to dot every I and cross every T and be sure of how to interpret everything. Interpret same that. thing in Judaism, same thing in Judaism. It's clear, especially with the first five books, it's very, you know, it's very compact. There are a lot of things that aren't spelled out well enough to quite know what you're supposed to be doing. The Jews understood this already, you know, 800 years before Christ. And so the Jewish understanding, the Jewish belief, is that God knew this when he gave Moses the Torah on top of Mount Sinai. So in addition to the five books of Moses, which were to be written down, God spent, and I believe the Jewish tradition is another 40 days, giving Moses oral instruction. Um, and that oral instruction was not supposed to be written down. It was supposed to be passed down from uh, teacher to disciple orally. And then when that was eventually written down, that became the Talmud. So the Talmud supposedly is the um, oral law given to Moses by God on Mount Sinai to be passed down orally, which eventually had to be written down um, after the destruction of Jerusalem, after the exile of Jews from Jerusalem, after the dispersal, basically, uh, uh, you can date it to 135 AD. Um, and then they just, the Jews decided, since we're going to be spread around the world with no focal point, we better write it down or else we'll never hold on to it. So that's what the Talmud is. However, since the Talmud was written down between the 200 and 500 AD, and it was written down by rabbis, uh, there's a lot of stuff in there which... Um, um, I, I'm trying to think of how to say this and how to say this nicely. There's a lot of stuff in there that on its own face could not possibly have been given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Among other things, there are accounts of things, you know, uh, actually there are accounts of Jesus in the Talmud. And um, this is getting too much into the weeds, but but the thing is that um, there's, there's, a, there's a core in the Talmud, which is supposed to be the oral law, but I, I mean, or law given to Moses, but as it was discussed by rabbis over 800 years or 1200 years, those rabbinical discussions are also, they're like footnotes, but the footnotes are like 10 times as big as the original text. So the Talmud is a combination of that core teaching and a tremendous amount of rabbinical discussion. And that rabbinical discussion then uh, goes up to the year, let's say, 200 or so in what 200 A.D. And it, it includes things about Jesus and so forth. Yes. Then how did all the negative things about Jesus and Christians that you said about that? How did that get brought into that then? Because it seems like it's a mix. It seems like it's a mix of that oral tradition as well as maybe some add ons. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's fine. The add ons pretend to be explanation of the oral tradition. Uh, but but it, it goes uh, basically it goes anywhere. It goes all over the place. So, yes. Um, and Judaism, uh, I'm not anti-Semitic, I swear. 
<laughs> but uh, Judaism for the last 2,000 years has actually been almost defined by its reaction to Christianity. And therefore, it's not like these rabbis between 200 AD and 500 AD are going to ignore the greatest disaster to ever befall Judaism, which was this false messiah, Jesus, who led so much of the Jewish nation astray and created this sect, which then went on to persecute the Jews because, according to the Gospels, the Jews were guilty for the death of God and so forth and so on. So, yeah, that, that did make its way in there. Okay, and then I know there's commentaries that were written about the Talmud, if I'm, if I'm correct, and then I guess like Maimonides and different commentaries. Is that also viewed with this, through the same kind of authoritative lens by modern Jews? The um, well, uh, um, first of all, you say by modern Jews, most modern Jews don't even believe in God, <laughs> much less in the Talmud. I mean, really. I was gonna I was gonna bring that up because you, you you mentioned also in this that now really I'm going too far ahead. But you said about something about after the Holocaust that was a, obviously a massive scandal, terrible thing, massive scandal, and 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 hurt the faith corrupted the faith of a lot of yeah people. but it actually started already in the enlightenment with the enlightenment just like it did in christianity by the way um that the enlightenment basically um in a sense tried to do away with dogma in all its senses the authority of the church the supernatural and so forth so it happened in judaism too but of course the holocaust was like the death knell so so when you say modern jews um if, if you're if you're talking about like Hasidic Jews, you know, with the ear curls um, or uh, ultra Orthodox Jews, then all of the Talmud is um, is considered authoritative, like magisterial teaching, um, including the rabbinical commentaries that are in the volumes of the Talmud itself. And um, there, they go up. Um, I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on exactly when the last one of those is, but I think they do go up to about the 10th century. Um, but I'm not actually 100% sure about that. Uh, but in any case, they go they go centuries and centuries after Christ. And uh, when you look at a page of the Talmud. Um, when I, I'm sorry, when I do this on my live stream, I've got lots of illustrations, but I just have to use my hands and stuff. Um, when you look at a page of the Talmud, there'll be a box in the middle of the page, uh, which is maybe like four inches by five inches big. And the page itself will be like 12 by 16 inches. And everything around that inner box will be essentially footnotes. I, in other words, it'll be um, nested nested squares of additional rabbinical commentary that of rabbis who were held in enough esteem to make their way into the Talmud. And it's concentric. So the earlier rabbis are closer to the center and to, until you have the outer box of the most recent of the rabbinical commentaries. Okay. And the Kabbalah, is that also authoritative to Jews or only some Jews? What's that? Uh, the, the, uh, the Kabbalah, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I'm trying to get rid of some glitch here or there. Um, I mean, again, my problem is actually making short answers out of these things. <laughs> um, the Kabbalah is a number of different things, depending on how you look at it. Um, a, a, a Jew who takes it seriously, takes it as essentially sacred scripture. And most Hasids do, most, most of the ultra-Orthodox today do, although that's a little bit scandalous. Um, there was a long period of time when it was considered uh, basically heretical, the Kabbalah. But um, the, um, it surfaced, uh, here's why I'm so hesitant. It's like Joseph Smith and the Mormon Book of Mormon. So, you know, is the Book of Mormon the Book of Mormon or it was the Joseph Smith make up the whole thing? And the Kabbalah is in that category, OK, because it actually only surfaced. Uh, um, I didn't prepare for the show, so I don't remember. I think it was 11th century, maybe 12th century in Spain. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the name, 
but there was a, um, a, a Jewish rabbi Kabbalist who supposedly found this long lost ancient text that dated back to the second century AD. Actually, yeah, the second century to around, to around 130 AD. And no one saw it except him and his wife. But supposedly the Kabbalah is that is based on that text. So the Orthodox Jews will think the Kabbalah was written by a rabbi referred to as Rashbi in the second century. He was way, 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 way up there as a superstar. Um, however, most other Jews will probably think that the it was originated in whenever it was the 11th century. Um, I, as I said, I'm drawing a blank on the rabbi's name who who surfaced it. Uh, and then it came, became very popular very quickly, and it spread through um, the network of uh, serious Jews in in Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Actually, I think within decades, it had basically, you know, kind of permeated the Jewish communities around, uh, um, probably around everywhere, but certainly around Eastern and Western Europe. And then with the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. And Portugal in the 15th century, um, then it then it centered in the Holy Land because basically those those very serious Kabbalistic rabbis all resettled in um, in Israel, and um, so anyway, it basically then permeated Judaism. Uh, it was always seen as mystical in its nature. Um, there is theoretical Kabbalah and there's practical Kabbalah. The theoretical Kabbalah actually has a lot of uh, inklings of Christianity in it. Uh, a lot of passages which actually are Trinitarian. They're certainly, they certainly sound like the relationship between God the Father and God the Son in some of those passages. Um, and anyway, the theoretical Kabbalah is, is kind of, it can be very beautiful. It's basically some of the issues are issues that we have in Christianity. How do you reconcile God's total love with God's total justice, right? I mean, that all of us get hung on that problem. Um, and so some of the theoretical Kabbalah is actually quite beautiful. It's trying to reconcile the infinity of God with the finiteness of creation. It's trying to um, figure out the relationship between the creator and the creation um, it's trying to figure out the relationship between the attributes of God, like his justice and his mercy and so forth. But then there's also something called practical Kabbalah. That's bad news. That's what uh, Madonna is into, into, presumably. And it's basically kind of like New Age occultism. There are even um, the you know invocation of demons, the invocation of angels the secret names of God that kind of force him to do things. I mean, it's really bad news. Um, yeah, it's, uh, there's, there, there's that occultism actually in Christianity too and in the Catholic Church in various centuries. Um, you know, you can think of the, like the alchemists of uh, whatever, the 17th, 18th century. You know, it's kind of like that. And so the practical Kabbalah is definitely super bad news. And the theoretical Kabbalah is, 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 it's certainly not worth it because you're not going to be free from demonic um, attention if you deal with it. Okay. So if I have this correct, of practicing Jews, of modern Jews, it seems that they all look at the, at the Talmud and all the commentaries of the Talmud, all of that as authoritative, basically word of God. This is our faith. And then the Hasidics... They take all of that plus the theoretical Kabbalah, and then there's the practical Kabbalah, which is no. more. Than, no, Look, it's not a, you're 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 trying to be far too logical, and far too uh, systematic. You're thinking like a Catholic. Think like a Protestant. Okay, I mean, in other words, what's baptism? Does baptism make a difference? Is baptism a sacrament? Do babies get baptized or do adults get baptized? And then you're going to make a statement about Protestants believe this or Protestants believe that. You know, so so uh, as I said, you know, most modern Jews are like Woody Allen. They don't even believe in God, much less. Well, should we take the Kabbalah seriously or should we take the Talmud seriously or just the Torah seriously? Um, 
So uh, there isn't that kind of consistency. I would say um, the vast majority of, of Jews, like 80 percent, don't even take the Torah seriously. They may they 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 probably they might think that the Torah reflects what God wants. I think they might think that. But it reflects what God wants the way people were thinking 2000 years ago and garbled through, you know, all of their biases. I'll give you an example, a nauseating example. OK, I'm not anti-Semitic, I, I promise. Um, the seminary in the United States, the uh, Reconstructionist Rabbinical Seminary, um, which um, ordains more ra Jewish rabbis every year than any other seminary in the United States. Very proudly, you know, I, I, I look at their website. First, very proudly, our first openly gay rabbinical student. Next, very proudly, our first, I'm not joking, transgendered rabbinical student, uh, a person who was born a woman and managed to grow a scraggly little beard and God knows what surgery is involved, but, you know, has the chutzpah to say she's a man now. And and now it has uh, very proudly the first openly lesbian president of the rabbinical seminary. And this is in a religion where women aren't even allowed to be rabbis. Right, right. Um, they're not even allowed to touch the Torah, actually. Um, and yet you have, uh, you know, there, this is a source of such great pride that they have transgendered rabbis and and partner lesbian rabbis and so forth in conservative congregations, not in reformed congregations, not in, um, you know, the, the furthest at the lax end of things. But, you know, they're nipping at the heels of the orthodox congregations. They haven't gotten there yet, but they're, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're, you know, you're you're almost like, you know, this is almost like having a um, partnered, openly gay um, SSPX priest. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like so. So anyway, so so you know, this kind of. I'm very interested in historical Judaism and what Judaism actually teaches and so forth, but you can't project that onto, you know, your local neighborhood synagogue. Uh, OK, OK. And as you said about even the word anti-Semitic, what did that mean to you while you were Jewish? And has that changed since you've become Catholic? Are there any mis uh, misconceptions of that word? What are your thoughts? What is anti-Semitism? I guess that's the question. <laughs> well, it's it is. Um, it is. Um, antipathy towards Jews and Judaism. I guess I know that what's antipathy. It's a good word to use because no one really knows what it means either. But it's basically, you know, negative feelings, negative attitudes towards uh, Jews and Judaism. And uh, it is also sometimes, um, you know, active persecution against Jews uh, and maybe even Judaism. I'm not sure if a religion can be persecuted. Um, yeah, that's what anti-Semitism is. And uh, there's. Um, you know, there's more of it now than there has been um, since the Third Reich. I mean, the, you you should read if you if you read the Jewish press, the exodus of Jews from England and France to Israel are incre is incredible now. I mean, the active the active discussion is: Can we afford to continue to live in France? Can we afford to continue to live in England? Or had we better get out while the getting is good? Um, in 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 France and in England, Jews cannot. I mean, in London or in Paris, Jews cannot be visibly Jewish walking down the street without being attacked, and and the police don't do anything. I mean, the um, interior minister in France, when Jews were being attacked on the street, violently attacked, um, if they were visibly Jews and beaten and so forth, said, "Well, what do you want us to do? We, you can't expect us to." you know, protect them all. They'll just have to go incognito. And this was the, yeah, I mean, this is the guy whose job is basically to protect the citizenry. I don't think they do wear um, 
you know, skull caps or something visibly anymore in, in France. Um, so anyway, yeah, this, it's tremendous. And, and a lot of it comes from the teaching of Islam because, because um, Islam actually teaches that the day of resurrection won't come until all the Jews are killed. Um, yeah, really, really. Um, basically, uh, and it started, it started with Muhammad. Muhammad said, quote, kill any Jew that comes into your power. Um, so Jew hatred is really, really, really deeply, uh, you know, woven into Islam. Uh, uh, Islam teaches, it's probably true, actually, that uh, Muhammad was killed by a Jewish woman. Did you know that? Seriously, that he was invited to a meal by a Jewish woman and he she poisoned him and he died thereafter from the poison that she had poisoned him with. That's not a way to kind of come and get into their good graces. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that's that's interesting. And then, and then I think especially like talking about the whole topic of Catholicism, Judaism, these different faiths, I guess it's difficult, especially not being born Jewish myself. It's you're trying to separate people from ideas whether it's Islam, Judaism, Protestantism, we're always separating the people from the ideas. So in a real sense, like Protestantism is an enemy of the church, but Protestants themselves are not, right? It's difficult because I feel like when we speak about Judaism, if, if there's ever something that's said that might be against um, Jude, Ju, Judaic teaching or modern Judaic teaching, then all of a sudden, boom, it's you're an anti-Semitic where you might not necessarily have that with if we're saying anti someone's an anti-catholic like the, the the label isn't as strong does that make sense uh well i think it's it's actually most critical when you're talking about islam because um i mean i will argue that islam is an extremely problematical religion let's say from top to bottom if you read the quran uh there's no question that it it makes a virtue out of violence I mean, I mean, the, the Great Commission, you know, the Great Commission in Christianity is go out and make disciples of all nations. The Great Commission in Islam is basically take over the world and uh, give the people the choice between conversion to Islam, uh, serfdom, semi-slavery or kill them. Uh, and that's the Great Commission. Because the, the Great Commission is, is in Islam is every human being in the world has to submit themselves to Islam. It's actually quite an interesting, um, can I say, diabolical um, aping of Christianity because it's actually the same. In some sense, it's the same impulse, right? We want to make, we want everyone in the world to recognize Jesus right. and for, you know who he is and what he did and so forth and love God. We just don't want to kill them if they don't agree. <laughs> so anyway. Islam, it's really, really important that that, of course, every Muslim is, you know, Black Lives Matter. Every Muslim, the value of that Muslim soul was the same as the value of your soul and my soul and so forth. They're an immortal human soul that was created by God to love him forever and be loved by him forever. And when you have a religion that is um, so kind of aggressively the enemy of everyone who isn't in that religion, then it's really easy, it's really hard to keep that separate. And we're super important to keep that separate. But I'd almost challenge you to um, name any teaching in Judaism that is distasteful to a Catholic, except for one, which is that Jesus, in fact, was not <laughs> the son of God. Um, but outside of that fundamental issue, which is, of course, what distinguishes Jews from Christians. It's almost the only thing that distinguishes Jews from Christians, because as you started, said at the beginning of the program, the entire Jewish sacred scriptures, because the Talmud is not really sacred scripture. It's, it's um, you know, written down oral tradition and rabbinic commentary on it. You know, the, it's still a different category. There's nothing in Jewish sacred scripture that the church doesn't think is sacred scripture period. Right. Okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. And as you said, also in the, in this book, salvations from the Jews, you said about there was that 
God created the, the Jewish people and also, well, created everyone and everything, obviously, but the, the impulse to remain separate, both nature and nurture, that that might be part of the, the Jewish identity. Can you talk about that a little bit? I know you can, will you? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, what? Okay. I'll go into my basic shtick. I kind of <laughs> have to, to answer your question. Um, what is what is Judaism? What is Catholicism? They are not two separate religions. They are two phases of the same plan for the salvation of all of mankind. Um, that plan for the salvation of all of mankind, God came up with already in the Garden of Eden. And that plan involved the incarnation of the second person of the Most Holy Trinity. I shouldn't have to say this because you have a largely Catholic audience, but remember, the second person of the Most Holy Trinity existed long before Jesus was born. Okay, He's co-eternal with the Father. So that plan from the Garden of Eden was that the second person of the Most Holy Trinity would incarnate as a man at some future point in time. And through his incarnation, his life, his teaching, his passion and death, he would not only restore man to the original state he had before the fall. Remember Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, no death, no suffering, no, no sickness. They lived forever. They basically were born into heaven, you could say. Um, the plan was that the second person of the Most Holy Trinity would incarnate and not only restore man to that original exalted state, but actually elevate him to an infinitely higher state um, at some future point in time. Well, okay, that's a great plan, but the groundwork would have to be laid. And that's what Judaism is. It was the, basically the first 2000 years of that plan involved picking up certain group of people on earth separating them out from everyone else and giving them a special relationship with God and a tremendous amount of divine revelation so that they could be the host family, let's say, for the incarnation. That's what the Jews were. Um, it was, you know, it was, it was phase one of the plan. Once the incarnation took place and Jesus did his thing, it's time for phase two, which is the Catholic Church and the sacraments. So... However, if you think of that, the only the number one job that the Jews had to fill for those 2000 years was to stay separate because, you know, they're a little tribe and these are nomadic tribes and everyone is conquering everyone else and intermarrying with everyone else. And they would just get, you know, kneaded into the dough of Middle Eastern humanity. But they had to stay separate because they had to receive that that revelation, a continuing stream of revelation of, of kind of like higher and higher revelation. They had to increase in purity and they had to produce a virgin of such purity and nobility that she could give her, her flesh and blood to be the flesh and blood of the God man. They'd have to stay separate. So I think that God gave the Jews uh, a, a number of tools to stay separate, to make them stay separate. And the Old Testament shows some of those tools because the laws in the Old Testament really keep you pretty darn separate. And my thesis is he might have even made the Jews particularly stubborn and hard headed and hard hearted and stiff necked. I'm not saying this. St. Stephen said it already. Right. So it's gospel in order for them to stay separate, because if they were just like, you know, Rod McEwen's of the Middle East or something, I mean, just. You know, just kind of, um, yeah, I, you know, the, the merry mailman or something, they wouldn't have stayed separate, but maybe their stubbornness and hard heartedness and thick headedness and, and even pride, uh, was, you know, was uh, maybe they were given an extra, uh, an extra uh, serving of that so that they would stay separate. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Now, I think changing gears a little bit, it seems like there were two big shifts in the perspective of, maybe the world and the church in understanding um, Jewish people and Judaism. It seems like the French revolution, the French revolution in terms of the world and society and Vatican II for the Catholic church. Can you speak about those? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point. Um, the, um, I would say the French revolution um, changed the the position of Jews in society. There's no question about that, totally. Um, 
I'm not sure changed the um, you know the the attitude towards Jews. In uh, other words, it was their emancipation essentially. It was like the emancipation of the slaves actually in, in the United States in a lot of ways. The Jews had no civil rights at all anywhere in Europe, with the exception of Poland, um, until the French Revolution. They couldn't own property. They couldn't pursue the prof professions. They couldn't employ Christians. Um, the the work opportunities were very constrained. I mean, the, the the jobs they were allowed to have, they couldn't live wherever they wanted. They in, actually, in much of Europe, they had to live in ghettos. They had to live in, uh, you know, enclosed, in, you know, fenced in, literally gated little sections of the city, and they had to be locked in at night and so forth. Um, Why was that? It really, what? Why was that? Well, you're the Catholic. You're going to have to tell me because <laughs> it was done on the order of the popes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, the um, uh, that's not much of an answer. <laughs> um, I, anyway, it's, it, believe me. That's again. That's that's too too much of a rabbit hole to go down to yeah. go down. Uh, the the general sense there there are a lot of reasons, but the general sense was that they were a corrupting influence on society. And they were a, um, basically, they were a um, unpleasant, disruptive, destructive population that if you couldn't exterminate them, you, you could, should quarantine them, essentially. Um, and, uh, I mean, there are letters after letters after letters of popes and stuff saying how, you know, what a scandal it is that Jews should be allowed to employ, you know, to have authority over Christians, to have Christian employees, um, that they should be allowed to live in the same neighborhoods as Christians. Um, even there for a while, there was automatic excommunication if a Catholic uh, had held conversation or ate with a Jew. Yeah, um, you know, they, they were this they were the ultimate polluting influence. Um, anyway, there are also other things, but anyway. Um, so anyway, but that that was the case pretty much throughout Europe until the French Revolution. The French Revolution was only the first of the anti monarchy revolutions in Europe. But, you know, others soon followed and. Um, you know, you had, uh, again, you had the overturning of the monarchy in Belgium. You had the overturning of the papal states. You had the overturning of the German um, city-states. It wasn't one country then. Italy wasn't one country then, right? They were city-states and so forth. And so over the course of about 60 or 70 years, the Jews became full citizens. Um, that didn't really, I don't think that was really so much a change in, in attitude or anti-Semitism as much as it was a... Um, uh, a, a kind of a, a emancipation. Vatican II, on the other hand, is like really amazing. It didn't really start with Vatican II. Vatican II is kind of the um, final imprimatur on it. It really started with um, Pius, I would say, Pius XI, it probably started with. Um, and then every pope after Pius XI became more and more um, <laughs> more and more um, uh, spoke more and more positively about Jews and Judaism. I, I'm trying to keep from throwing gasoline on the flame, so I'm choosing my words carefully. Um, the um, Pius XI really was a very dramatic character in that in that progression. And as was, I know I, I, I am going to skip over Pius the Twelfth. I know you wanted me to say Pius the Twelfth. John the Twenty Third was incredibly, incredibly uh, pro uh, Philo Judaic, very, very sympathetic towards the Jews. And of course, after him, uh, Paul the Sixth and and uh, John Paul the Second and and Benedict and Francis. Um, and and of course, in the middle there, you had Vatican II. But Vatican II was a watershed in that it was a church council that codified the new attitude towards the Jews. Um, of course, it said, uh, oh, uh, it's in Nostra Aetata, but 
you know, it said, among other things, that um, I'm paraphrasing, but anti-Semitism is always and everywhere um, an evil, um, and uh, the Jews are not to be considered rejected by God, for the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable, which is a quote from Romans 11. So anyway, it was a really big, it was a really big sea change in the kind of the public posture of the church towards the Jews. Okay, yeah, because that was one of the things I was always trying to make sense of that I'd love to get your feedback on with, of course, we know the Catholic faith doesn't change. There always is that continuity. And then, and then it seems like there's a shift in focus and like how to make sense of that in my mind. No, no you say, you say the Catholic faith doesn't change. And I'm not, I'm not going to say anything heretical. I mean, I'm not a heretic. But you have to be careful because dogma never changes. Dogma yeah. never changes. But attitudes that permeate the Catholic world do change. Does that make sense? The, atti the attitudes? Attitudes that permeate the Catholic world. Okay. Okay. I mean, I, I bet that um, in the 16th century, I actually know this for a fact, most of the Catholic world thought that I hate to say this, that blacks didn't have souls. There was a lot of difficulty in getting missionary activity going to Africa because the prevailing opinion was that the blacks in Africa were not human beings and did not have human souls, and therefore they were not to be, you know, missionized, evangelized. I'm not joking. Would that be, would that be individual Catholics versus the authoritative teachings oh, no, no. Of, of the faith? Well, see, that, see that's, that's the thing. Uh, you you got to have a middle ground. You can't just make it individual Catholics and authoritative teaching of the church. That's why I said the 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 general attitude in the Catholic world. Okay. okay. Even including the general attitude in the in the um, hierarchy in the Catholic hierarchy that has changed. There's no question. I mean, I am sure that there. I, I know for a fact because in fact, he's a Jewish convert, so he's he's a uh, um, Venerable Francis Lieberman, um, he he was trying to get some action going to evangelize blacks in Africa, and he like went to the Vatican and everything, and he had to start his own order to do it <laughs> because he couldn't get any interest going because basically the consensus was, you know, they they weren't material for evangelization. I am sure that there were centuries when the attitude of um, the Catholic world was not uniformly against human slavery. I strongly suspect that's the case. Um, there were certainly centuries when the attitude of the Catholic world, in, including saints and including the hierarchy, were that it was an affront to Christianity for Jews to have civil rights, for Jews to be to have equality. Oh, boy. You, you may or may not air this, but I, here's a here's a quiz question. And I don't have all of your audience out there, so I have to ask you. OK, uh, by law in the papal states, Jews had to live in the ghetto. They had to be locked in at night. They had to be within the gates of the ghetto at sundown. The gates were locked. They weren't allowed out of the ghetto until sunup or whatever. They, they weren't allowed to live anywhere outside of the ghetto. And um, uh, when, when, what year do you think the restriction of Jews to the ghetto ended in the Papal States? Remember, the, the sovereign of the Papal States was the Pope himself. There was no other government of the Papal States. It was the Pope. I would, I would guess probably sometime around the French Revolution in the 18th century? Uh, uh, 1869, with the fall of the Papal States. As long as there were Papal States... The Jews were restricted to the ghetto until until under Pius IX. You know the story of Pius IX. The, that's the Risorgimento. It's the, oh. the that's the French Revolution made its way to Italy. Basically, that's when the French Revolution, oh, not the French Revolution literally, but the wave that the French Revolution was the beginning of, made its way through Italy and overturned the Papal States. It was a, it was actually a Masonic plot. It's very interesting history. But basically, you know, this Masonic plot succeeded in overturning the Papal States and creating Italy. Um, and uh, 
And that's when the Jews were allowed out of the ghetto. There's a little twist to this because Pius IX actually let them out of the ghetto for a couple of years and then decided he made a mistake and put them back in the ghetto. So there, there was about a two or three year period under Pius IX when he experimented with letting them out of the ghetto, but it didn't last. So anyway, that's it. And and the um, man, I have the documentation for this, whether you believe I mean, in other words, you may not want to believe this, oh, but yeah, the Vatican newspaper which today it's the Osservatore Romano, but in the beginning of the 20th century, it was the Civilta Cattolica. And um, it published articles routinely saying that the Jews uh, tortured and killed Christian children for blood, for the matzah, for Passover. And that they basically could not have Passover without, you know, having the blood of a Christian child. It was published into the 1930s in the Civilta Catholica. It was actually Pius XI who called the editor of the Civilta Catholica into his office and said, you're not going to be editor anymore if you run any more of those articles. The 1930s. Wow. Didn't one of the Piuses fight against Hitler? Or was it, I thought I heard that like somewhere in the New York Times that that one, or one of the Jewish or maybe a Jewish newspaper said that the Pope is doing more for the Jews during the time of the Holocaust than anyone else. One of the pious. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was Pius XII. Um, the Pius XI wasn't the Pope during the Holocaust, but there is an entire industry of um, maligning and defending Pius XII with respect to, you know, his behavior towards the Jews and what he did and what he didn't do and what he said and what he didn't say and so forth. Really, there you know you could have probably twelve, at least twelve feet of bookshelf space of books on just that topic. I only have about eighteen inches behind me of that. <laughs> <laughs> wow! And then I guess one of the one of the results when I think of Vatican II in the old right, uh, uh, the um the traditional Latin Mass versus the Novus Ordo, when I saw the prayers comparing the the prayers for the Church on Good Friday, I noticed that the prayers were a little bit different in the old right versus the new right. Are you familiar with that? And, and how are we to view that? There's quite a history there. Um, this is for the um, Good Friday liturgy, um, you know, that three o'clock on Good Friday. And there is a section in there. There, there are uh, prayers of intercession, essentially. And the first, the first prayer says, you know, for the Pope. And then there's this beautiful long prayer. I'm talking about the the old version, the old, old right, the, the Trinitine right, you know, a beautiful prayer for the Pope and then let us kneel and everybody kneels. And then there's, you know, a prayer and then, and then, okay, rise, everyone rises. And then there's a prayer for the rest of the hierarchy, the same thing. And then there's a prayer for the entire Catholic church and the same thing. And then there's a prayer for you know, non-Catholic Christians and the same thing and so forth. And it actually goes out in this kind of, um, from the center outwards, this kind of radiation from the center. So from the Pope, concentric circles, basically. And um, one of them, just before the pagans, I believe, is for the Jews. And first of all, the Latin refers to them as perfide which is usually translated as perfidious, which is a, nas uh, a nasty word. It's a pejorative word. You know, it means whatever, um, not exactly disreputable, but uh, dis dishonorable and so forth. And then it prays for their conversion and without kneeling because it was considered um, inappropriate to go down, basically to kneel for the Jews when the Jews would not kneel before Jesus. I'm just saying the history. Anyway, so that's the way it was until um, John the 23rd, I think. And uh, it was softened a little bit. Um, and uh, I believe it was John the 23rd took out the word perfidious and uh, restored the kneeling. Maybe that was done not exactly at the same time. And John the 23rd felt so strongly about it that when he was celebrating or when he was when that service was being said in St. Peter's and he was, you know, the 
principal celebrant when the priest who was leading it forgot because it was the first year of the change and said perfidious Jews uh, John the 23rd stopped the service and said no you have to go back okay so um, and then uh, I think that's probably the only two changes. I don't remember the whole story. But then in the Novus Ordo, um, it got changed completely so that there's no prayer at all for the conversion of the Jews. Um, there's a prayer for the Jewish people that they might come to their fullness of their relationship with God or something like that. But no prayer for the conversion of the Jews. And um, then when Benedict the Sixteenth put in the... Um, universal indult for the Tridentine Mass. Um, the very first year of that indult, it did not apply to the Triduum. I don't know if you remember that. But basically, any priest could celebrate the Tridentine Rite except for Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter. And I actually think the reason is because they hadn't figured out quite what to do about that prayer for the conversion of the Jews. They didn't want to go back to the old form uh, because it seemed too, still too anti-Semitic. Um, it's not anti-Semitic at all. The perfidious was p possibly anti-Semitic, the word perfidious. But even that is a little bit ambiguous because it, it, the etymology of the word perfidious is partly faithful, right? Per means partly and fides is faithful. The Jews are partly faithful because they have the Old Testament. They just don't have the New Testament. So I'm not sure when the Latin was put in, you know, in the 14th century, whether they meant perfidious like the word perfidious or whether they meant simply half part of the faith, but not all of the faith. Because if you look at where it is in the concentric circles, it's in between the non-Catholic Christians and the pagans. So it's where you'd have part of the faith, if you see what I mean. Anyway, and then don't ask me a question because you're gonna get an hour long answer. No, I love it. This is great. I'm learning a ton. I, I guess when I, when I think about that, as we said before, you said before about the great the Great Commission, teach all nations, right? Is that, and we spoke about anti-Semitism, what it is versus what it's not. Is it anti-Semitic to pray for the conversion of Jewish people or even the whole world? I, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I mean, that's the heart of my mission is try to encourage prayer for the conversion of the Jews. Um, no, it's anti-Semitic not to. It's the most anti-Semitic thing you can do <laughs> is deprive people of Jesus and eternal life. So so I, so I guess then you have the old right. So, you, so basically you have 2000 years of the Catholic Church, roughly. And then up until about Vatican II, the old right, the new right. It's basically 98 percent of Catholic tradition. You said basically there was an attitude one way and then a shift to a different attitude. Um, it seems like some of the things were good some of the things were bad what what were the pros and cons of each of the of, of each of the different attitudes the pre and post vatican II? because it seems like we're praying for them in a way to, to yeah, bring them to the fullness of the faith I know. But yeah. yeah i would say the bad of the post vatican II is precisely what you identified which is it has totally killed um evangelization of jews not only praying for the conversion of the jews it's killed but it's, it certainly killed missionary activity towards the Jews. You know, there, there are a lot, there's a lot of Messianic Judaism in the world. You know, in other words, there's a lot of Jews coming to faith in Jesus. You know, there are like hundreds of congregations in the United States of um, Messianic Jews, Jews who think Jesus was the Messiah. Um, there are, there are um, every day thousands. I mean, there, there was a um, Messianic Jewish evangelist who used to go to Russia and have these prayer meetings and get 500, 1,000 a night Jews come to faith in Jesus. None of them are finding their way into the Catholic Church because the all of the missionary activity towards Jews, all of the evangel evangelization of Jews, none of it is being done by the Catholic Church. It's all being done by either Messianic, Judaism, or by Protestant groups. And so that's really, I think that's the downside of um, the shift in the attitude coming out of Vatican II. Um, the, uh, yeah, I think that's the downside, is that it's killed prayer or or evangelization of Jews. Yeah, okay. Right, and I know that um, a lot, the thing that a lot of people say is that, well, to bring, pe to help bring the Jews back into the Catholic faith, people have, t people have spoken about and websites geared towards having a 
a right, a, a Jewish right of the Catholic faith, a, I guess a Hebrew Catholic right. I remember we spoke about this in person at your presentation. I was shocked when I heard you say that you were against that. Can you explain yeah, why? I'm definitely against that. Well, um, there is a multiplicity of rights in the Catholic Church. I think maybe like 21 or 22. I'm not sure. It's at least 12. Um, they all come about because there is a pre-existing right um, the, uh, and a population that follows that right. Say the, I don't know, the, the Maronites or something or some various, some group of of Christians somewhere in the world following that right who want to enter the Catholic Church and um, they want to enter the Catholic Church with their pre-existing right and they don't want to have to change. And so because the universality of the Catholic Church is a really good thing, in other words, because basically God wants the whole world to be Catholic. I, I don't worry, I won't cut off your head if <laughs> if you don't convert, but it's still what God wants. Um, then it's worth it. In other words, the cost of having multiple rights is worth it in order to produce a, a unified church. Um, note that when you're talking about Jews, there is no pre-existing right. It would be have to be made up from a blank sheet of paper. That's never been the case with any of those rights. They haven't been a group of people who have been allowed to sit down and decide what they want, <laughs> what they want. Number one. Number two, as my friend who's actually the head of the organization trying to generate this thing, or used to be at least, um, there's an old saying, two Jews, three opinions. How on earth would you ever get all of the Jews to agree on what this new right would be? No, I think it should be this. No, I think it should be this. I think it should be this. What are, I mean, really, it, it's kind of ludicrous on the face of it to think that you could get, and so you're going to get a community of a couple hundred thousand people to kind of have a Congress and decide on a new right. It's going to be worse than Nova Sordo. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. It's, it sounds a lot like Italians. <laughs> you're yeah. not going to get two Italians agreeing on things. Yeah. So, um, uh, no, there's, there is already, uh, the Nova Sordo right exists in Hebrew. Um, the, uh, you know, it's just not doesn't seem very Catholic to me to um, to to start over again. Yeah. And as, as you kind of alluded to there, I read a book that Father Ripperger, Father Chad Ripperger recommended um, how Christ said the first mass. Yeah. And it was speaking about how a lot he was speaking. Um, it was written in like 1909, 1910, something like that, about the traditional Latin mass and how the many elements taken from the, the synagogue services and the Last Supper and how that so would would a modern would a modern Jew look at the Tridentine Mass and say more this feels more like home or more like what my faith would be rather that was, than that, that was definitely my experience. The Tridentine Very Mass very strongly, yeah. Was that um the the Tridentine Mass felt a whole lot more like Judaism than the Novus Ordo Mass. Wow. Yeah, no question. Why? Why? Um, um, the um, a number of reasons. If you walk in, if you walk into a traditional church, okay, what do you see? Straight down the middle line, you see the tabernacle. Um, near the tabernacle, you see a light that's never supposed to go out, right? You have uh, steps up to the altar. Um, you have only the priest or the servers up on the altar. <laughs> if it's traditional enough, you have only men up on the altar. Um, the, um, uh, the Blessed Sacrament is handled with uh, infinite reverence. It's unthinkable that it should be allowed to drop drop to the ground or anything like that. As a matter of fact, in the traditional rite, you're not allowed to touch it, right? Only or only consecrated hands are allowed to touch the Blessed Sacrament, um, which so is why it's placed the on the vessels. tongue. And the, vessels, and the sacred vessels themselves, the ciboriums, the, the, um, the, um, is that right? the chalice. Oh, yeah. 
in 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 traditional Judaism, okay, you walk into a synagogue, you've got a straight line, you have the Ark of the Covenant at the end of that straight line. That's where the Torah scrolls are. You have a light over it that's never supposed to go out, the eternal light. Um, what is in the tabernacle in the Catholic Church? It's the Blessed Sacrament, which is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. Who is Jesus? He's the Word of God. What do you have in the Ark of the Covenant? You have the Torah scrolls. What are the Torah scrolls? They are the Word of God. Who's allowed to touch the Torah scrolls? No woman is allowed to touch the Torah scrolls because they're ritually impure. Um, when Even when the rabbi reads from the Torah scroll, he uses a silver pointer so that the Torah scroll is not touched by his finger. You know what I mean? Because you're going to want to follow the words. But it's only touched by this silver pointer. Um, if a Torah scroll should fall to the ground, everyone present has to fast in reparation for the sacrilege. And when a Torah scroll gets worn out, has to be discarded, it gets buried in a human funeral in the ground. What happens to the Eucharist if it has to get discarded? Right? It gets buried in the ground. You can't dispose of it casually. Um, the entire sense of, of the of the sacred, the separation of the sacred from the profane is there in the Tridentine rite in the old form of Catholicism and has been almost completely eradicated in, you know, uh, I get the most that. modern manifestations. Um, now, unfortunately, it's being eradicated in Judaism, too. But when I was growing up, no, I mean, there's no way you would casual, you would touch a Torah scroll. There's no way you would, you, you know what, when there's a procession of the Torah scroll, like the procession of the Blessed Sacrament on, on, on festival days, and the rabbi walks around the congregation carrying the Torah scroll. And, you know, everyone's worshiping, I don't want to say worshiping the Torah scroll, but reverencing the Torah scroll. And what you do, you have those prayer shawls with the fringes, the men. They they wrap their finger in the prayer shawl and they touch the Torah scroll and they touch your lips as a way of like kissing the Torah scroll. But because of the sense of the sacred, they're not going to touch it with their finger. They're certainly not going to kiss it. You know, they use a sacramental intermediary there. So you were saying with the Tridentine mass, better approximating or better resembling what the Jewish faith looks like. And at the end, uh, I felt much more at home because of the sense of the sacred and the uh, separation of everything, the separation of the sacred from the profane, from of the priest, from the people, um, the reverence with which sacred objects were treated. Um, you know, if you read the Old Testament, it's almost ridiculous. You know, you, you, um, you read um, uh, Leviticus or something, you know, the incredible ritual purity. That's required. And um, there isn't a whole lot of that <laughs> in the Novus Ordo. Have you seen conversions of that with with people that you've maybe maybe Jewish people you've taken to a Tridentine mass? Have you, or have you heard about that? Oh, listen, you know, the Hasids with the long ear curls and the long beards. I invited a Hasidic friend of mine to a Tridentine mass. And it was the first Tridentine mass he ever saw. And he was absolutely blown away. He was yeah. absolutely enthralled by it. Granted. He tell the truth, he was al he already believed in Jesus. I mean, in other words, he he wouldn't have. I mean, that's 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 how I got to know him. Was he was interested in Christianity and so forth? He was interested in the Catholic Church, in fact. <laughs> actually, I think it was I think it was an Italian Catholic girl that actually <laughs> sparked his initial interest. But he broke up with her. But he was still interested. There it but is anyway, not. he definitely he definitely the 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 Trinitine Mass you know, made sense, perfect sense to him. That's great. Excellent. Excellent. And another one off question for you about St. Maximilian Kolbe. I heard some people accused him of being anti-Semitic. Have you heard of that? And what's the deal? With yeah, that? no, I've, I've actually written on that um, in another book. Um, there are there are Catholic saints who I am willing to accuse of being anti-Semitic, but he's definitely not one of them. His his anti-Semitism he wasn't at all anti-Semitic. As a matter of fact, he got, I don't want to say he got in trouble, but when he had, when he ran Nyepa the the Franciscan monastery in Poland, 
which was the largest, I believe, the, lo the largest monastery in Europe at the time, had 600 monks, I think. Um, he took in Jewish refugees and fed them and, you know, housed them and everything. And some monks actually gave him a hard time about that, saying, you know, we don't have enough to go around. We don't have enough for, you know, the Catholic people who come to our door. You know, we shouldn't be taking care of these Jewish people. And he wouldn't have any of that. I mean, Maximilian Kolbe wouldn't have any of that. Uh, there were two things he did that are um, accused. Well, the three things that resulted in him being accused of being anti-Semitic. Um, one is that um, he had a heart for the conversion of the Jews and wanted the Jews to convert. I don't think that's anti-Semitic. I think that's pro-Semitic. Another is that he uh, had started the largest, I think it was the largest new daily newspaper in Europe. The, uh, I think it was called Night of the Immaculata. And uh, he went to Japan for a while. And the editor of, the, of that newspaper, while Maximilian Kolbe was in Japan, printed some anti-Semitic articles. Um, so, you know, if, if, if that had been uh, Maximilian Kolbe who had printed those articles, there might be a case there. But I, as far as I can figure out, uh, they, they were printed when he was away. And the last thing was that he believed in the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. You don't know what that is, do you? Protocols of the Elders of Zion? I've heard of it, but I don't know the extent yeah. of it. It's, it's a classic um, anti-Semitic fake document. I mean, in other words, it's, it's all fake. It came out of, um, not, not it wasn't the KGB because it was the late 19th century, but it came out of Russia, some, you know, some kind of psyops campaign of the time. And it purported to be the secret document of the Jews' plan to take over the world. And uh, Maximum and Colby believed it was for real, but the truth is almost all of Europe believed it was for real at the time. Um, so, you know, it's not, it's not really a stain on him that he didn't know better, um, you know, that he did not identify it as the fake that it was. Okay. So those are the grounds for the accusation of anti-Semitism. But in fact, um, I, his behavior shows otherwise, and all of those, all of those um, grounds, you know, prove themselves to be uh, canards. Prove themselves to, you know, uh, dissipate like like smoke once you see what's really behind them. Okay, and I, I never read E. Michael Jones' book, uh, The Jewish Revolutionary Spear. What do you make of that? I'm not a fan. I mean, I like some, uh, I like a lot of what E. Michael Jones has written. Um, but I'm not a fan of that book. Yeah. I don't think he has it right. Yeah. I don't know. I, I haven't read it, so I wouldn't be able to know where, where he got it right or where he got it wrong. Yeah. But, and then the other one-off question I had for you was about the Messiah now. What do, and I, get, I guess being sensitive to, like, as you said before, you can't say what do Jews as a whole believe about the Messiah right now because to view it more as Protestantism, what, but... <laughs> Is there a general where maybe Hasids believe this, Orthodox tend to believe this, conservatives tend to believe that? What's their stance on the Messiah this day and age? I would say only the very religious believe in the story of a coming of a Messiah. Um, so, yeah, I, conservative Jews, Reformed Jews, ordinary Jews think, actually, they tend to think, they tend not to take it seriously. Or if they take it seriously at all, they think it refers to the role of the Jewish people as a whole. Um, that's another common interpretation. Um, the very Orthodox really take it seriously and pray for the coming of the Messiah and expect an imminent coming of a Messiah. And every so often they decide somebody is the Messiah. And um, that tends to cause a lot of trouble. But the, I mean, it's it really is quite frequent. I mean, uh, there were two, I don't have the years right. I think early, maybe early, Sabbatai V was a very big messiah, supposedly. I mean, he was, you know, in other words, he had hundreds of thousands of followers. I think it was the middle of the 19th century. Um, Jacob Frank um, was, was, uh, was another maybe messiah, so to speak. And the, the worst is that um, just about 15 years ago, there was a third one, the head of the uh, Chabad movement, which is a very large Hasidic sect, died. 
Rabbi Schneerson, and he caused a schism in the um, sect because a number of his followers thought he was the Messiah, actually thought he would come back from the dead. What would, I, I guess, what are the implications or what, what has historically happened? I don't know the, the deal when, when there are certain Jewish people or certain groups within Judaism that believe someone's the Messiah. Is that, is that dangerous? Is it, I mean, what, what's been the history with that? Well, it can be, it can be, um, dangerous, like, you know, Jim Jones was, was dangerous. And it actually was in the case of Sabotai Svi and Jacob Frank, it was dangerous because, because they were a little bit too much like Jim Jones or David Koresh or whatever. There was a lot of sexual misbehavior in the cults. In, in other words, you know, uh, anti, yeah, basically, you know, they, they, there was a large cult that then grew up around them. And uh, where you have cults, you tend to have sexual misbehavior. And uh, so it's dangerous in that sense. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, they die out. They die out. In the case of Sabbatai Zvi, um, it's a little complicated history, but a lot of them became, a fair number became Muslim and a fair number became Christian. And presumably some number went back to uh, Judaism. Oh, hey, I have a a um, little factoid. <laughs> um, Louis Brandeis, do you know who Louis Brandeis is? Yeah. Supreme Court Justice, okay. beginning of the 20th century. He invented, single-handedly, he invented the constitutional right to privacy. Okay, yeah. literally. Um, the constitutional right to privacy is the basis on which uh, pornography has become legal homosexual uh, sodomy has become legal contraception has become legal explicitly when contraception was uh, legal what's that griswold versus connecticut and abortion became legal all of those supreme court decisions hinged on the constitutional right to privacy which was an invention of louis brandeis louis brandeis's parents were followers of one of those false messiahs they were followers of jacob frank um they they came over from uh, Bohemia or Prague or something to the United States, and their son was Louis Brandeis. So we have the total degeneration of the of you know our culture and our legal system and our 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 legal morality <laughs> hung you know hung on the peg of one of these followers of the false Messiah. Louis Brandeis, by the way, might have I don't want to say he was a follower, but he had a picture of the uh, false messiah on his desk I, I, as a Supreme Court justice. So um, <laughs> who knows, who knows? Well, now I guess I guess now that brings up, so did that happen maybe during the Middle Ages and these times where where you said that, that, the, ch that the church and the people in the church, the popes were much more strict um, with how they dealt with Judaism and, and, and Jewish people. Did they intuit that that could possibly happen? Is that why? I don't know. Why would they why why would a pope care about whether Jews became the followers of a false messiah or not? Well, if it had the implications like you said. And though you mean this this the sex cults and stuff? No, no, this one guy who is the who's the justice? Oh, Louis Brandeis. Well, they come on. I mean, they they they, 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 would, they would have to have a crystal ball or something. I mean, following a false messiah doesn't mean you're going to end up the Supreme Court justice, you know, the head of the Supreme Court in the United States. I know it's, t it's always tough to connect the dots. So it's like we're going forward, going backwards. No, basically, I'll tell you what my dots are there, by the way. Okay. Uh, my dots there are that whenever you have a cult, um, uh, you always have a, a, a strong demonic influence uh, through the cult leader. Cult leaders always almost always they're rewarded by Satan with um, uh, through sexuality, through sexual proclivity and opportunity. Uh, read the accounts of Rasputin or David Koresh or Charles Manson or Jim Jones. They not only would have, you know, hundreds of partners, but they would have maybe dozens of partners in a night or a dozen partners in a night. I, I, I don't think there's any question that I mean, the devil is prepared to re reward his servants uh, with money. Just look at Jeff Bezos or or uh, Bill Gates. 
um, and or reward his servants with um, with whatever they want, basically, you know, with 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 sex. And um, so I think that I think that there was something really demonic flowing through the cult that Brandeis's parents were in. And maybe that he was in if he had the cult leader's picture on his desk in the Supreme Court and that um, the demonic worked through Louis Brandeis to dissolve our legal protections against immorality in this country. So that's my connecting the dots. Interesting, interesting. Oh, man, that, that's great. Thank you so much, Roy. This was tremendous. Where can we send uh, people your way, yeah, no, uh, your information, everything? If they're still listening, <laughs> maybe they're interested in some of this stuff. Um, uh, my website is salvationisfromthejews.com. Salvationisfromthejews.com. Um, and my website has links to everything. Um, I have a weekly radio show on Radio Maria, which is uh, called Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism. But there's a link to that for my website. I have a YouTube channel, which has become a bigger and bigger part of my ministry. And I have a literally, um, I want to say literally hundreds, maybe not hundreds, but certainly a, over 80 um, videos and audios up on my YouTube channel of um they all revolve around these the same topics and um i have uh now i have live streams once or twice a week i i mentioned to you maybe it was before the show i just did 12 two-hour segments on a series called what is judaism and it seems like that's what you wanted the show to address is what is judaism but I go through everything, you know, we talked about and, and much, much more. But just from the very beginning, literally sort of in the Garden of Eden, you know, through the various forms, through what happened to Judaism with the coming of Christ and with the crucifixion and with the destruction of Jerusalem and the Talmud, then the, Talmud, then the Middle Ages, then the, emancip then the uh, Enlightenment, the Emancipation, blah, 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 all the way through the present and um, I'm doing a series right now that I'm pretty excited about called, um, I should know what it's called, uh, Faith and Reason, I think, The Rationality of Faith and the Irrationality of Denial, where basically I talk about that. I talk about how all of the evidence is on the side of the truth of the Catholic faith, and um, there is so much evidence contradicting materialism, contradicting atheism, contradicting even evolution. Um, and I, I, I mean, if viewers of this show, you know, are serious Catholics, they may know about the Eucharistic miracles, for instance. And the most recent Eucharistic miracle that's heavily documented was 2008. So we're not talking about the Middle Ages. And the host that got transformed into human muscle tissue, heart muscle tissue. It was put under electron microscopes. It was examined by forensic scientists who didn't know where it came from. It went through the full gamut of 2008 modern science and passed with flying colors with no, no natural explanation whatsoever and so forth. So basically that's the theme of the series is that no, you have to check your mind at the door if you want to be atheist, essentially. But you can hold on to all your marbles if you're a believing Catholic. That's great. And that Eucharistic miracle was in Brazil, right? No, actually, uh, the one in Brazil was 1999. Uh, I and it was in Buenos Aires when Bergoglio was the bishop there. Uh, the 2008 one was Poland. Okay. But the one in Buenos Aires is, is, has this, basically the same story behind it, that it was examined fully forensically medically and so forth and passed with fine colors yeah that's that's great stuff roy we're going to keep sending people your way to the best of our ability they okay. said i'm i'm a big fan of your work i was so happy to meet you in person and watch you speak in new york city when you came i read your book which is still definitely one of the best books i've ever read salvation is from the jews i read it in four days i gave it to my grandpa who is responsible for um bringing me uh deeper into the catholic faith since okay. i this was the last book he read when he was alive. So. Wow. Thanks for letting me know that. That's great. Ab absolutely. So thank you very much for all your work. I really appreciate okay. it. Okay. Well, thanks for your work and, and uh, keep it up. 
and uh, send me a link or something when it's somewhere. Will do. Okay. Thanks well, for the invitation. Take care. God bless. Bye.